We've been talking a little bit about CSS or cascading style sheets. What I'd like to do in this lecture is to talk about how we can leverage cascading style sheets in a powerful way to reduce the amount of work that we have to um, do in order to have a presentation of our website look good on multiple different devices. That process is called responsive design. And so that's what this lecture is about. My name is Professor Donald Patterson. The observation at a high level that we want to tackle is that web design should be responsive to their environments. They should respond to their environments. And Bootstrap is one web framework that supports designers in achieving this. So what do I mean when I say responsive? Well, there's a lot of different ideas about what responsive might mean. From the ubiquitous computing community or the mobile computing community, the idea about uh, something being responsive means that it should be uh, very respond. It should change how it works based on a rich understanding of a deep and complicated context that a user is embedded in. So perhaps what the application does changes based on which location it's at. Maybe it changes based on time of day. Ideally, it would change with response to the user and what their intents are, what their emotions are and maybe what their capacities are in the sense of accessibility or um, distraction concerns. Doing one thing if you're driving, another thing if you're blind, another thing if you're walking, another thing if you're angry, another thing if you're hungry. You might also want your application to respond to the weather and maybe respond to ambient social environments so that your application does something different if it's in a movie theater during a movie versus a movie theater after the movie. This would be great. It would be terrific if we could have this level of responsiveness in our applications and it was um, done well. But for the context of this discussion, when I talk about responsive, I'm scaling it way down. And what I'm talking about is simply being responsive to the screen size of the device in which a website is being um, experienced in and being responsive to its orientation as well. This seems like a drastic scaling down of the kind of context that we'd like our applications to be aware of, and yet it still is quite difficult to do well. So the strategy that we're going to employ in order to tackle this is to try and just write one set of code that's going to work on multiple different um, devices. So we could imagine that we would have one website that's for the iPhone and another website that's for desktop computers and another website that's for Firefox, and another website that's for Chrome, and another website that's for um, Android, and another website that's for the Apple Watch. That would really be a pain. It would be difficult to maintain. It would be difficult to make sure that all the different versions were consistently presenting the same aesthetic, user experience, and functionality. So what we would like to do instead is we would like to have one application that through clever design, and through um, good use of libraries and CSS, works well on all of those different platforms. Much easier to maintain. The alternative is to have all these different fragmented code bases. We want this one set of code to render properly on multiple different, pro multiple different platforms. Now that's going to be a challenge, and that's, um, that's the primary reason, that's what responsive design is about, is trying to do this one set of code that works on multiple different devices. Now a challenge to, uh, that we run into here, and the reason why there's a problem, is that devices are constantly being created with new resolutions and aspect ratios. So think about the entire iPhone lineup. The iPhones, the iPhone 7 Plus, the incoming iPhone 8, the tablets, the iPads, and the watches. All these different resolutions and different pixels, uh, aspect ratios. Designing a website that looks good on all of them is challenging. That's just Apple devices. What about all the different Android devices? All the Kindles, all the Sony devices, all the Samsung devices, all the Galaxy devices, all the HTC devices. All of them potentially having different orientations. Um, all of them potentially having different um, pixel widths and heights. And not just do we have to worry about the portrait orientation, but we also have to worry about the landscape orientation, which doubles all of them and actually creates a very different design environment for rendering content. So that's our challenge. And on top of our mobile devices, we also have desktop environments where 
who knows what size a web user's web browser is in when the page is being rendered. They can just change the size arbitrarily, maybe maximize it to the whole window or maybe minimize it um, and keep it down in the bottom corner to keep it out of the way. All of these cases need to have a, a good rendered web app, a, a well-engineered, a well-crafted website will render well in all these different environments. For the sake of maintainability, we would like to do that with just one set of code, one set of HTML. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a strategy that's based on using a design layout that uses grids and columns to organize our content. This is taken from um, publishing industry and the magazine publishing industry. And what it means is it means that we're going to restrict ourselves somewhat in what we are going to be able to lay out on our web pages for the sake of getting responsiveness across many different platforms. So let's think about what, it, what that looks like in a magazine context. So here's a screenshot of Dwell Magazine, and you can see that this has a pretty strong visual aesthetic of having columns and rows in it. Let me overlay some of the um, different places where the columns and rows occur. And what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this layout language, this visual language, in terms of rows and columns, and then allow the CSS to put those columns and rows in an appropriate place based on the size of our document, the size of our window, um, which is dictated by the different devices and environments in which our website is being viewed in. Now the challenge for doing this is that it's very, very difficult to get it right in all the different web browsers and all the different rendering engines that are out there. It's very difficult to have something that works right in Internet Explorer and in Chrome and in Firefox and in Mac and in Droid. The CSS and the platform glitches that you run into are, are, are numerous and very complicated. You have all kinds of code like the th little screenshots that I've, sna that I've snapshotted here um, that have to be just right and have to be tested on all the different um, platforms. That's more than what a single person uh, really should be doing for a web application. And so our strategy for tackling this is that we're not going to run our own grid system. We're going to use another grid system by loading it as an external style sheet. This grid system will be created for us as a library, which we can use. And as long as we conform to the conventions that that library asks us to conform to, it will do the work of laying out our web page on all these different platforms. Um, it, this is a very effective way to get a res the ability for your website to be responsive, um, but it requires as designers that we work within the systems that these libraries um, define. An example of such a framework, it's not the only one, but it's a very common and powerful one, is called Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a free and open sourced software library. Um, it started as a project at Twitter called Blueprint, and Twitter decided to release it to the community, and now it's open source and being developed independently of Twitter. It's primarily a CSS library. What does that mean? It's an external style sheet which, with a bunch of rules that have been written into it that you can leverage by, by attaching class attributes to your nodes in your HTML tree, your elements in your HTML tree. There is a little bit of JavaScript as well to help glue some of these pieces together. When you, use Blue, when, you lose, when you use Bootstrap, it causes your web pages to have a default aesthetic applied to them. Some people don't like that, but fortunately, Bootstrap also has the ability to reskin that aesthetic. So if you don't like the way it looks um, when you use it in the default mode, it's possible to load different themes on top of Bootstrap so that you get different um, visual presentations. We're going to be talking about Bootstrap 4. Bootstrap 4 is not quite released yet, but it's coming down the pike. It's a very powerful and well-engineered system for being able to manage grid layouts and also give you access to a bunch of um, basic uh, website functionality. This is the logo that you'll see if you go to um, Bootstrap's website, where it says that Bootstrap is the most popular HTML, CSS, and JavaScript framework in the world for building responsive, mobile-first projects on the web. I don't know about that claim, but it certainly is a good um, framework. Here's an example of what maybe the very simplest Bootstrap website can look like using the version 4 um, template. Now, most of this code 
I got from the Bootstrap web page as uh, the template of a basic f um, format. So let's walk through some of the components of it. It looks hairy, but it's actually all things that we've seen before. And if we take a moment to parse it, almost everything we've seen before. If we take a moment to parse it, we'll be able to read it all right. So for starters, we have an additional attribute in our HTML, the LANG attribute and the EN value. That says that this website is going to be written in English. It's not, it doesn't have to be written in English, but that's what that means. We're going to have a title saying it's a responsive web page example. And then we're going to add some meta tags. We're going to say what character set this file is represented in. And we'll use UTF-8. And then we'll see a meta line that we haven't seen before. And this is one that has the name attribute set to viewpoint and has particular um, value applied to the content attribute. And what this does is it causes this website to be rendered in the way that it, Bootstrap expects, particularly on mobile devices so that it uses the mobile device in a way that um, is consistent with the desktop experience. So this is just boilerplate. You just add this to your um, Bootstrap website, your Bootstrap enabled website. Then the next thing that we look at is we look at the external style sheet. Now this external style sheet, we've seen examples of this before. We use the rel attribute and say style sheet. We provide an href attribute. And while the URL there is complicated, it's just a URL. It has a scheme, HTTPS, and a, and a um, host, maxcdn, bootstrapcdn.com. This is an organization that volunteers to host the Bootstrap library, and we see a file path indicating which version we're currently using. There's an additional attribute called integrity, and that integrity attribute makes sure that the code that we're downloading or the library that we're downloading is the actual one that we intend to download. This prevents people from inserting code um, on um, external sites and us using it and then us getting code that we didn't expect. So integrity is basically a fingerprint saying that if the code that we get from the Mac CDN website doesn't match this fingerprint, um, then, then it tells our browser not to use it. The cross origin attribute is used um, because we are getting content from someone else's website. So this enables us to get content from someone else's website, verify it with the integrity attribute and download it. That's details. This also is just boilerplate code. But the main thing to realize here is that this is just a request for an external CSS style sheet, one that would have a bunch of selectors and curly braces and then properties like font, font family and font size and color, all those things. Just it's going to be written for us. That's in the head section of our HTML. Meanwhile, down in the body section, we have an H1 uh, tag with the content hello world and then at the very end of our body section, we have three script tags. Now we haven't talked about script tags, but scripts are, scripts are the third component of um, a web application where HTML is our content and CSS is our presentation. Script is our JavaScript, which adds interactivity. And so again, you can kind of read between the lines what's happening here. We're loading three different bits of JavaScript from external locations indicated by the source attribute. And like our, like our CSS external style sheet, we're asking to make sure that it has a fingerprint of, that, of what we expect so that we don't run uh, malicious code on our, um, in our user's browser. So three script tags um, and a CSS tag. When we put all this together and we run it in a web browser, uh, we get a very simple website that says hello world and it's been styled according to the bootstrap default style. So that's, what you, that's all you have to do in order to get a Bootstrap website up and running. That's enough to give you access to all the functionality of Bootstrap. But we haven't talked about what that functionality is or what the conventions are for building a responsive website. We'll do that in another lecture. For now, I just want to introduce the idea of responsive web design and the Bootstrap framework. For further reading, particularly if you'd like to know a little bit about the background of responsive web design, here are three different um, URLs. The first one is from um, a website, and the quote from that article is, creative decisions quite literally shape a physical space, defining the way in which people move through its confines for decades or even centuries. Working on the web, however, is a wholly different matter. So this talks about responsive web design with the context of architectural design. The second one says, for many websites, creating a website version for each resolution in a new device would be impossible, or at least impractical. Should we just suffer the consequences of losing visitors from one device for the benefit of gaining visitors from another? 
Or is there another option? This article is a motivation for responsive web design. And then finally, of course, Bootstrap version um, uh, 4 of the alpha release of version 4 um, to see more about the details of what can be done with Bootstrap. So in summary, responsive web design adapts to different devices, browsers, and physical orientations. It's a step along the way to making much more responsive web applications. Doing this manually by ourselves would be very difficult because of the variety of devices and software configurations that are out there. So instead, we'll use a framework like Bootstrap, whose developers have done the work of making sure that it's going to work consistently on all the different devices that are available to us. In the next lecture, we'll look at some details for how to leverage Bootstrap to make websites that, we, that, that work the way we want them to. Thank you for your attention.